So, um, the new year, 2008, second Sunday, and um, a lot of people uh, take the opportunity for a new year uh, to start uh, a process of life change. Uh, they want to make themselves a bit better, and so when the calendar ticks from December 31st to January 1, they start to make these plans. We call them New Year's resolutions. And uh, I had this wonderful PowerPoint all made, but unfortunately it's not going to work today. And, uh, but when we make resolutions, people generally come to them, I think, with a, with a heart of sincerity. They, they're really trying to do something sincere with their lives. And now we might look at this, uh, the resolutions that they make and see them as being you know, very, very grandiose, very big, or maybe trivial. But I think the one thing that combines or that binds them all together is that the people are sincere uh, in their endeavor to change and to make themselves better. That in the next 365 days, or in 2012, 366 days, that when the calendar ticks over to another new year, they will emerge a better person, sort of a, a Norman 2.0 perhaps, uh, as the saying goes. So, and I think that a lot of this, this idea of sincere change can be borne out if you were to look, uh, I did a Google search, uh, and you'd look at what the top 10 most common um, New Year's resolutions are. And so number one on the list is to spend more time with family. Uh, number two, get fit. Number three, lose weight. Number four, quit smoking. Uh, enjoy life more. Six, quit drinking. Uh, number seven, get out of debt. Uh, learn, number eight, learn something new. Uh, number nine, help others. And number ten, get organized. I think if you look at each of those items, I think that you can you realize and you, you admit that those are sincere endeavors to make yourself a better person, uh, even if it's just for yourself. But I mean, you can see improvement, uh, you know, is, is wanted. Um, I personally don't make New Year's resolutions. Uh, I think it's mostly because I've tried in the past and I failed, and so I just gave up. Um, I think it's better to, what's that, it's better to just try and fail than to not try at all, but I don't go by that. Sometimes I just think it's better to not try and then not have the disappointment of failing year after year after year. But there are things that I hope for. 2012 will be a big year for me. Um, I'm going to be a father in maybe less than a month, and so... Uh, my first child is on the way, and there are definitely things that I hope for, uh, and especially in regard to uh, my upcoming son. I hope that I will be a good father. I hope that I can show my son who Christ is and that he can come to faith in Christ. I hope that um, I can prepare him for the realities of this world, and I hope that one day I'll get to see him with a family of his own. But I think that the one thing that underlies all of these hopes is that there's a sense of worry and a sense of fear that I won't succeed. And that's why I say, I hope. I hope for these things because I can't guarantee that I'll be a good father. No matter how hard I try, I can't guarantee that that would be the case. I can't guarantee that my son will have faith in Jesus Christ. I can't guarantee that I'll be able to prepare him properly for the realities of this world. And I can't guarantee that I will live long enough to see him with his own family. And so I express these desires, genuine desires, but I express them as hopes because they are insecure. I cannot guarantee them, and so I hope for them. And so I think that when people make New Year's resolutions, I think that there's a similar undercutting there. I think that... Regardless if we say, I will lose weight, I think that we can always express these New Year's resolutions or these I will statements as I hope statements. They're always hoping for something. I think that if you were to say, like the first one, um, to spend more time with family, I will spend more time with my family. I think you could easily state that as I hope to build a more genuine bond and a closeness with my family. That's what time is supposed to bring. And so that's what we hope for. I think that if you were to say, I want to lose weight or get fit, I will lose weight. But you could also say, I hope to be you know, a more better person so that I can enjoy the things that life has to offer more. 
Or if you were to look at another one as I will get my life organized, you can say, I want to get to be able to spend my time on the things that matter most. And so we say, I will, I will, I will, but the reality is that people fail. Recent research says that uh, despite 52% of persistent participants in the study saying that they were confident that they would succeed at their New Year's resolutions, only 12% actually reached their goals. 88% failed. In a different study in 2007, 78% uh, of people who made a New Year's resolution in the study failed to reach their goal. And so I think that despite the fact that we say, I will do these things, because we inherently cannot guarantee that we will reach those goals, that we cannot guarantee that we will lose weight or that we will quit smoking or that we will spend more time with family, we express it as an element of hope. We hope for these things. And so I think that they are perhaps it's a more honest way of making a New Year's resolution. And I think that some of this is borne out if we were to compare the two lists. So if you look at, I'm oh, sorry, the two lists, um, top 10 things that people say that they will do on New Year's, and here's a top 10 list of things that people fail at, the most common failed New Year's resolutions. Number one, lose weight and get fit. Uh, number two, quit smoking. Uh, number three, learn something new. Number four, eat healthier and diet. Number five, get out of debt. Number six, spend more time with family. Number seven, travel to new places. Number eight, be less stressed. Number nine, volunteer. And number ten, to drink less. And I think that uh, we can both agree, we can all agree, that if you look at the two lists, they pretty much match up pretty well. That despite the sincere hope and sincere intention of the people to improve themselves in these ways, 88, 78%, the vast majority of people will fail. And so when we express hope, we're actually admitting to ourselves, even if it's just subconsciously, we're admitting to ourselves that it's insecure that because we can't guarantee these things, it's not something that we can just say that we have. And so we wonder sometimes, I guess, what is the hope in hoping? And so as a Christian, I can't help but ask, what is it that we are to hope for? And today's uh, scripture, the Apostle Paul says uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.8, uh, that we are to have the hope of salvation. But if in looking at New Year's resolutions and in the inherent insecurity of hope, is Paul trying to say that we don't have salvation? Doesn't, how does this work with Paul when he's writing to the church in Ephesus, and he writes in Ephesians, that you are to put on the helmet of salvation to ward off the schemes of the evil one? He also says in Romans chapter 8 that you do not hope for what you already have. And so we seem to be having Paul on the left hand saying we need to hope for salvation because we don't have it. But on the right, it seems to say that we do have it and make use of it today. You know, we can use it today to ward off the schemes of the evil one. So why is there this contradiction? Is there a contradiction? And I think that the contradiction does not lie in what Paul says or teaches us about salvation. I think these, the contradiction lies rather in how we understand hope or how we use the word hope. Earlier I talked about today when we use the word hope, it's robbed of its power, it's robbed of its security because we realize that the vast majority of the time we won't get what we hope for. So if that's not what Paul's saying, how does Paul use the word hope? How does the Bible use the word hope? And so I'd like to turn to uh, Psalm 33. Um, and I'll give you a second if you uh, can find it. I, again, had a PowerPoint, but it's not here. So in Psalm 33, I'm going to start with verse 16. And it says, No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. 
But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Now notice where the word hope was used. In verse 18, he says that we hope in his unfailing love. In verse 20, hope for the Lord, he is our help and our shield. And in verse 22, may your unfailing love rest upon you, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Each time that hope is given expression in this psalm, it is not given to something that the, that the author is unsure of. He says that he has hope for God who is his help and shield. He has hope in unfailing love. And he has hope in, again, unfailing love, uh, who is, whose hope is in the eternal God. And so the psalmist, when he writes about hope, he's writing about something that he is sure of. He's writing about something that he has access to. He has something that he has no question of. He's put his hope in unfailing love. He's put his hope in God who is his shield. He's put his hope in the eternal God who saves. And so the Bible and the Apostle Paul, when he uses hope, he uses it differently than we use it today. Today, hope is expressed towards something that we have limited confidence in, in obtaining, whereas the Bible, hope is expressed towards something that we have a strong confidence in obtaining. And so that's the difference. That's the difference in between the, in the scriptures, or something we hope for and something that we have. And so, what is it that we can do with this today? And so, when we talk of becoming like Christ, um, we use a big word called sanctification. Basically, it means becoming like Christ. And so, we talk in terms of how God sees us, uh, and that's our position. Uh, and he talks about how we live. We talk about how we live, and that's our experience. When God sees us, he sees his Holy Son. He sees perfection. Uh, because we have been made one with Christ. But as we live our life, we continue to sin. And so we are sinful. But we are striving towards that perfection. We are striving to make the experience of what we see every day the reality and be in harmony with what God, how God sees us. We are striving from sinful to sinless. We are striving from imperfection to perfection. That's what this life is. It's a strive. It's striving towards becoming like Christ. And so we can see that even though God sees us as being perfect, we understand that we are imperfect in this moment. But we trust and we, you know, we have confidence that when the time comes, we will be made perfect. We will be made like Adam was made originally. When God looked down and saw his creation and said it was good. Right? There will become a time when how God sees us and how we are will be in harmony, will be in unity. But we realize that today there is that sort of dual nature to the idea of sanctification. And the same is true with salvation. Um, salvation is that moment of unity with Christ. It's that moment of forgiveness where we were opened up to the reality of our sinful nature. And we were washed clean once and for all. We were, we were forgiven. And... We were forgiven by the atoning sacrifice of Christ, his death upon, the, death upon the cross. That is when we were saved. And so God entered our life, and he's begun a good work in us. And so today we experience forgiveness, a forgiveness that when completed in us, will bring us to sinlessness. The work has begun, but is not complete. And so just as becoming like Christ has a dual nature, salvation has a dual nature as well. Salvation for us today is not an all-access backstage pass at like some rock concert where you come up to security and you just wave the pass and you just keep on walking through. When time comes, we will stand before Christ as he sits on the judgment seat. We won't be able to just wave a pass and just walk through the pearly gates. No, we will have to stand there. As we read uh, in a previous sermon I talked about, he will say, as we're standing there before them, the sheep and the goats, you know, you, my faithful servant. <coughs> And so we will have to stand before Christ, just as all people must, but we don't fear that moment. Because the Holy Spirit within us testifies to our kinship with Christ. 
He testifies to our oneness with Christ. He testifies to that moment of salvation. And that we are the children of God and co-heirs with Christ, that we might share in his eternal glory. This is the hope of salvation, that when Christ appears, that when we are brought before Christ, our salvation, our unity with Christ, will be made complete, and the riches of God's grace and mercy and love will be made complete within us. So in trying to understand this nature, I like to think of uh, the, the parable of the prodigal son. Um, and so we understand the story of the prodigal son where he takes his inheritance, he runs away, he squanders it all, and he lives a life in destitution, hoping to even eat as well as a pig. And so he sets his mind to return home in hope of his father forgiving him, in hope that his father will save him from this life of misery. And so he, sets, so he sets off home, and we read that while the son was still far off, his father seen him and ran to him. And you can see in that moment that when the father saw his son, his salvation was assured. He had already been forgiven. In his heart, the father forgave the son in that moment and ran to him. But even though physically apart, even though they were not together, the son had already achieved or received salvation and forgiveness because the father had already made it real in the father's heart but for the son it became real it became um, the f into fullness when the father embraced his son when he took him in and he wouldn't even let the, f the son finish what the son is going to say the son starts oh please you know, stop just we're going to go celebrate now and so the son seeking forgiveness while apart from the father has forgiveness. He has been saved, and yet it's made complete when the father and the son are united. And so we are like the son. We have salvation, but it has not been made complete yet. We have it available to us because we have the spirit of God within us, leading us, directing us, prompting us towards Christ. It will be made complete, though, when we are with the father, when we are in his holy and loving presence. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. Or the writer in Hebrews chapter 9 says, Just as a man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ has sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So there is no contradiction in what Paul says in Ephesians or Thessalonians, but rather a difference in application. We gain strength from the words of Paul to the church in Ephesus to put on the helmet of salvation to, to ward off the schemes of the evil one. Because we have the Holy Spirit within us. God has sent his spirit to be with us, to comfort us, to strengthen us, and to help us to become like Christ in this life. What the hope of salvation provides, then, is endurance and focus in this life as we look with joyful anticipation uh, to that moment when we will be forever united with Christ. So we are, to use the words of Robert Heinlein, uh, strangers in a strange land. This world, this cursed and broken world, is not our home. Our home is with Christ. We are children of God, and our life depends and is pointed towards that union. As Christ himself said in John 14, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. We can hold for, firm and secure to this promise because we know that God does not lie and that God has sealed this promise with the resurrection of his son. This life is a journey that has its beginning in the moment of forgiveness and it ha finds its completion in our unity with Christ upon his glorious return. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Peter sorry, uh, puts it this way, Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. 
In talking about this life, the Apostle Paul, many times in many different books, uses the metaphor of a race. So in using this metaphor, Paul is trying to express the reality of this life in Christ. Everyone runs the race, he says. Everyone runs the race. But too many, too many of the people run it for a crown or a prize that will perish. But we as Christians, we as those who have been saved, we run it for a crown that will last forever. And so in light of this reality, Paul offers up advice. He says that we are not to run aimlessly, but to keep our eyes on the prize. And we are to run this race with purpose and with a firm goal established in our hearts and minds. When I played rugby in university, we would practice Monday to Friday, five days a week. We would practice day in, day out, um, to get our bodies prepared for the game that was to come on Saturday. And then on Saturday before the game, I was always encouraged to sit down just by myself in a moment and to picture the game in my mind, to go through those moments in the game, to picture in my mind what it is that I will do when certain things happen. And so the idea is to get my mind and my body in unity, in unison, to get that pointed to towards the same goal, the same direction. If you were to watch uh, a bobsledding team prepare for a race, you'll see the driver going through the turns and the twists and everything in the track in his mind. Uh, soccer players are always talked about when coaching on taking a penalty kick to see the ball in the net, even before the ball is even struck. Sprinters, when they're running for 100 yards, they don't look behind them, they don't look to the side, they look to the finish line. They always have their goal firmly in front of them. And so, in their mind's eye, the finish line is there. The ball is in the net, the try is scored. Everything that the body is racing towards, the mind is already seen and is set towards. So Paul tells us how we are to run the race. In Philippians 3, he says that, But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straighting towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The goal for which he is straining is eternal life, spent with God and heralded by Christ's return. Paul runs his race with purpose, and just as rugby players or sprinters, bobsledders and soccer players train so that they can achieve their goals, so too does Paul. Paul talks about beating his body into submission. He talks about taking fighting to take every thought captive for Christ. Uh, he talks, when he talks to Timothy, and he encourages Timothy to fight the good fight and to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. This is a man who had been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Yet, despite all this, he sees his life in Christ as being fruitful. The Apostle Peter teaches us and tells us and encourages us to continue the fight as well. In 1 Peter he says, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ, Jesus Christ is revealed. It's no wonder then that when Paul, uh, he's finishing up his third missionary journey, he's returned uh, to Israel and he set his heart on returning to Jerusalem. Uh, his friends warn him time and time again. A prophet comes in and shows him what's going to happen to him, that he is going to be bound, he is going to be rested, and he's going to face death. And yet Paul says, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of Jesus Christ. His life in Christ had been a life lived in humble submission to the will of God. In all of this, the beatings, the jailings, the shipwrecks, the want, the hunger, through the trials before the Sanhedrin, the two Roman governors, and a Hebrew king, 
what was Paul's focus? The coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that will usher us into eternal life with God. Paul's focus was always on Christ. In his uh, writing from a Roman jail cell, Paul said, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Paul kept his eyes on the prize and ran the rice so as to be worthy of the crown he is to receive. Jesus, during his Sermon on the Mount, warned us, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The road to life is narrow, and as such, we can easily lose our way, we can get sidetracked, we can wander from the path if we, unlike the sprinter, take our eyes off the finish line. Paul said that he did not run aimlessly. He didn't just go any which way he wanted. He didn't take the path of least resistance. He didn't follow the crowd. He just didn't say, okay, let's go left. You know, he set his sights on the prize to be won upon Christ's return and ran the, life, the race of this life for the glory of God. That is why we wear as a helmet the hope of salvation. A horse wears a bridle. And as we use it to direct the horse, and so as we use the bridle to direct the horse, the helmet, as we use it on our head, our heads, our minds, as we set our focus, it will direct where our bodies and our spirits go. Romans uh, 12, 2 says, do not, be conform, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect world, will. So point your mind towards the coming of Christ. Direct your minds to the fulfillment of salvation that will be achieved on that glorious day of Christ's return. For he did promise to return, and while we may grow worry, weary, like the disciples did in the Garden of Gethsemane, we are to fight the good fight, we are to struggle forward, and we are to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. The hope of salvation, the firm assurance to which we hold, is that upon Christ's return we will know and experience fully the forgiveness of sins for which we have now been given a taste. We, now, we have now but a mere glimpse of what salvation is all about. Paul says that now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. We have been called to be holy just as Christ is holy. And on that day, on that glorious day of Christ's return, that is when we will experience fully God's holiness. But for now we are to run the race, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, to capture every thought, and make it captive for Christ. We are to beat our bodies into submission. We are to flee evil, to fight the good fight, and to pursue righteousness, God, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. We are to run the race in such a way as to win the prize and to bring glory to Christ Jesus upon his return. We are to set our minds on the things of heaven, not on the things of this earth. We are to turn away from ungodliness and to put to death our sinful desires of sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, debauchery, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness. We are to do away with anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from our lips. Rather, we are to live by the Spirit of God, and we are to give life to love, to joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, compassion, and humility. We are to encourage one another, to build one another up, to warn those who are idle, to encourage the timid, and to help the weak, and to be patient with everyone. We are to be cheerful no matter what, to pray all the time, to thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you to belong, who belong to Christ Jesus to live. 
And we are to bind all these things together with love. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That is the hope for which we hold firm. And it is not a hope robbed of power through fear or worry, but rather it is a hope full of power, because it is firmly rooted in the word of God, who, through the angel, said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. We are not alone. We are the church. We are brothers and sisters called to help one another run the race in such a way as to win the prize. We have the Spirit of God with us to empower and direct us. If we live our lives in humble submission to God, he will guide us through the narrow gate and keep our paths straight. And we have a cloud of witnesses cheering us on. Those who came before us and who have run the race and are waiting, awaiting us at the finish line. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, and most importantly, Jesus. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we had better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever, and now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Keep your eyes on the prize. Eternal life with Christ and run the race so as to bring glory to Christ when he returns and comes again in glory. For that is what we hope for, our salvation made complete in Christ upon his return, that we may enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise for the King. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. I, Jesus, have sent my angels to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. <laughs>